everybody. How are we? Oh, good. Good. Glad that two of you spoke up. Yeah, there we go. It's good to see you all. It's uh, good to gather. Welcome to Corndale Church. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I'm pastor of greeting. That's my new thing right now. So um, I, some housekeeping things uh, just to remind us. Uh, we've been doing this for a few weeks now. Um, the foyer is, is uh, for your children that are unruly to take them out there and um, give them a chance to calm down if you need to. There's also a video out there, so you can watch uh, the uh, service from there as well. Um, the offering box is out there. If you brought offering um, in the foyer, there's a black box on the wall. Um, you can put your offering in there. Also, bathrooms, we're asking one household or family at a time. And what else? Oh, second service. This is second service. Oh, welcome, everybody, on Facebook Live. Hi. Um, we're glad that you're a uh, part of us as well, and we ask that you would just pipe in and let us know where you're viewing from, but uh, thank you for joining us online. And, oh, the and also the last thing, uh, communion. Uh, pastors, uh, again, will be bringing communion to you, and, uh, and, and yeah, that's it. And let me pray, and we'll get going. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to gather together. Help us this morning to celebrate the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome. Uh, my name is Ryan, and I am also one of the pastors here, and it is so good to be with you this morning. Um, and we are gathered this morning because the Lord is good. He has drawn us to himself. He has adopted us into his family as sons and as daughters, and he has given us to one another uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we, we gather to sing, to, to celebrate, to remember uh, who, who God is and what he has done for us, to, to submit ourselves under the authority of his word and to give thanks to him for his faithfulness. So uh, we're going to begin our time this morning in song. Will you please stand with me? We are going to sing together. Clear your greatness by the wonder of your hands. How they magnify your glory, shedding light upon the lands. Every night they preach your goodness, and every day reveals your mind. Oh, the heavens declare your greatness through letters made of light. in beauty as he rises from this place like a bridegroom from his chamber like a strong man runs a race so the sun will not be silent but he rises every day to proclaim your matchless glory through every glowing ray Shine upon the darkness, so word of truth shine bright. Abide with me forever, your law is my delight. More than silver, a precious blood gold, all is sweet. Be pleasing in your sight As the stars shine in the heavens So your law is my delight For it preaches of your goodness And it tells me what is right And it brings me through the darkness By the radiance of your light Upon the darkness, so word of truth shine bright. Abide with me forever, your law is my delight. More than silver, a precious pure gold, law is sweet and it 
you please read out loud with me from Psalm 55? Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint, and I moan because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked. For they drop trouble upon me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O oh God, will cast them down into the pit of destruction. Men of blood and treachery shall not live out half their days. But I will trust in you. Amen. This morning we remember that we need to cast our burdens on the Lord, for he has delivered us. Let's continue now to praise him together in song.
This morning, we come to worship as sinners who are in need of a Savior. Each of us has had moments of faithfulness this week, and we've also had moments of temptation and of sin. We consistently swing back and forth between worshiping Jesus and worshiping ourselves. And left to ourselves, we would never choose God over our sin. And yet, he chooses us anyway. And he leads us into repentance and into righteousness. So let's take a few moments now to respond to his leading. Let's confess our sin. Let's bring it to him in repentance. And let's turn away from it and turn towards Christ in righteousness. Friends, our God is gracious and he is mighty to save. Let's pray. you please read out loud with me a prayer of repentance. Father, we come before you, these but a portion of the catalog of transgressions we have committed against you. If you, O oh Lord, should mark iniquities, if you would tally up the number of things we've preferred above you. If you would count the number of prideful thoughts or lustful thoughts or bitter thoughts or envious thoughts that have accumulated in our hearts. If you would open the record and judge us for every empty or idle word we've spoken. O oh Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness through Christ Jesus, who was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and by whose wounds we are healed. Amen. Friends, in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Psalm 34 tells us, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. Friends, this is good news for us this morning. God has forgiven us. He has delivered us. He has lifted us up out of our sin and out of our shame, and he has placed us in Christ. And we are free. So let's give thanks to our God. Let's give thanks and praise him together for his great love and his kindness that he has poured out so graciously upon us. my shepherd there's nothing i lack he makes me lie down in rich pastures of green he fills me with goodness and doesn't hold back 
I'm led beside rivers of water serene. Oh, surely the goodness and love of the Lord will follow me all of the rest of my days. For I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord to eat from His table and sing to His praise. Descend. I'll not be abandoned, whatever will be. For Jesus goes with me as shepherd and friend. His rod and his staff are a comfort to me. Oh, surely the goodness and love of the Lord will follow me all of the rest of my days. Good morning. My name is Rust. Good morning. My name is Rustin. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so excited you guys are here. At this point in our service, we like to acknowledge the fact that our God is a reconciling God. He reconciled us to himself through the sending of his son on our behalf, and he has also reconciled us to one another. The fact that we are all gathered here together and we are all worshiping the same Lord is evidence of the fact that He is at work. And so what we do is we take this time and we greet one another. And what we are doing is we're saying, yes, welcome to the family of God that I have been brought into as well. So please take a moment and greet your neighbor as you are able.
All right, all right. I love hearing your voices. Love seeing you guys connect with each other and welcome each other. Um, I have a couple announcements I need to make sure you guys are all privy to. Uh, first, uh, we're still in phase two, and we don't really know what uh, the future holds for us in terms of this week in phase three, so we just ask for you to be nimble, keep track of church communications. It may be that something new changes for next week, it may not. Well, it just just keep track, be flexible, be nimble with this. I also want to let you know about some stuff that's coming up. Again, we're doing our kids' ministry on Facebook Live on Tuesdays at, uh, at 10 a.m. on Facebook, as well as doing elder-led devotionals on Facebook Live on Monday and Wednesday at 7 p.m. In, uh, we're also continuing our practice of setting aside Wednesdays for the sake of praying and fasting that the Lord would bring this time of... Um, the strange time of isolation and uh, weird rules about meeting to an end. And we pray that uh, ultimately that God would supply for us what we need and that God would act mightily during this time. Also, there is no youth community this Thursday. We're on youth summer night schedule, which means that next Thursday will be our youth summer night, and there will be information on Facebook about that as well. Well, we are continuing our series in the Psalms. This has become our tradition of summertime, of going through the book of Psalms, and we are going to be in Psalms 21 today. If you have your Bible and want to turn there, I invite you to do so. But while you are uh, preparing yourself to hear from Psalm 21, I'm going to go ahead and pray that the Lord would bless the preaching of his word. Father, we come to you hungry we come to you in need. We come to you with a, a sense of how fragile we are and how fragile the things that seemed so solid in our world truly are. We come to you in the midst of a time of conflict and distress and trial and confusion, and we ask you to lead us, to lead us by your hand, to lead us by your word to lead us in the paths of righteousness and faithfulness and joy. God, we pray as we come to your word today that you would speak to our needs, speak to our confusions and our fears. God, that you would set upon, in front of us your son, that we might cast our hopes and all of our cares at his feet. We pray this in your name. Amen. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. Psalm 21. To the choir master, a psalm of David. O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your salvation how greatly he exults. You have given him his heart's desires and have not withheld the request of his lips. Selah, for you meet him with rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold upon his head. He asked life of you. You gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you bestow on him. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts. In the Lord, and through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out all those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath, and fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants from the earth and their offspring from among the children of man, though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed, for you will put them to flight and will aim at their faces with your bows. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. This is God's word. Be God. Amen. You guys may be seated. So three years ago, the elders got together and decided that we wanted to, every summer, 
take a break from whatever it was we were doing and set aside the summer to begin going through the massive book of the Psalms. And the reason that we did this is we, we believe the Psalms are a crucial part of the life of the body of Christ, a crucial a component of what it means to be the people of God. So one of the things that you'll notice is that uh, Pastor Ryan has been actually working very hard to in- make sure that we're including in our worship the Psalms. There are many songs that have been made out of the Psalms, and we are, want to be a people who know them and sing them. The book of Psalms is a song book. And as such, in the canon of Scripture, it's utterly unique. It is a collection of prayers and songs and poems. And they were words given to us by God in order to speak them and say them and sing them and pray them back to God. And as such, they are the words that God teaches us teaches us through. He teaches us through our singing and through our saying them back to to God. They are the words that God gives us to train our hearts. They are the words that God gives us to look at every situation through our life, whether it's tragedy, whether it's rejoicing, whether it's pain and sorrow, whether it's seeing injustice in the world. He gives us words in the book of song to sing to him, to bring every one of those things to him. Songs have a way of getting into your bones, right? Songs have this way of when you sing them, when they're on the tip of your tongue, they're, they're, they're deeper than just the words you read in that book yesterday. They're, they're kind of, you, you carry them with you when you sing them. That's what, that's, that's what we were meant to do with the Psalms. The Psalms were supposed to be God's word getting into our bones through songs. So one of the things that, it's, it's no surprise in the New Testament, you'll see this, The Psalms are the most quoted book in the Bible. Why is that? Because they were sung. They were sung. They they were taught through the Psalms. Not only are the Psalms a teaching, a thing that God gives us to teach our hearts and teach our minds the truth of God, they also form us to be a kind of people. The Psalms are the, the anthems of God's people. Just like we have a national anthem and people know that, that those people, the, that's the song that they sing. So we are a people who are given songs that shape us and form us to be and to live lives that are like the people who belong to God. The Psalms are also dangerous. It may not be something you, that you immediately think of, but King David who was a man of war and a man of battle, was also a man of song. He was a musician and a songwriter. And sometimes we think of these things as completely separate, and we shouldn't. Oftentimes, God uses, to glorify himself, songs in the defeating of his enemies. The Psalms are written often in the midst of, of trial and intense conflict. That's like, like that, that is the psalm we are looking at today is one of those psalms. And I don't think I need to persuade you that the world that we live in is one that is full of conflict. We're living in the midst of a, a, an intense time of conflict and change and frustration. We have a virus sweeping through the country. We have Cities full of unrest. Not very long ago, cities were burning. We, have, we had riots in the streets. We have uh, injustice. We have racism and the response to racism. We have all kinds of things, and it's all leading up to what? It's an election year, so we're one of the, in, in one of the most divided states I can recall our country being in, in, our, in my life at least. And it all is kind of leading to this point of intense conflict. There are questions that many of us have about the future, and where we are going, and what the future will look like. All conflict and all trials, from the greatest to the least, have this way of exposing the frailty of the many things 
that we are prone to put our trust and our hope in. Those things can be our job, our relationships, our finances, our health, our abilities, our freedoms, among many other things. And these are all good things. But when they're threatened, we feel threatened. We feel pulled into darkness, into anxiety, into fear, into joylessness of all different kinds. And when this happens, what do we do? What does the world do? And what are we so prone to doing? We look for a king. We look for a ruler, a president, a governor to fight for us, to solve our problems. In fact, this is how all of our elected officials try to get our vote. They tell us the thing that we're afraid of and how bad it is, and then they do their best to convince us that they are the solution to that problem. Are you threatened by foreign adversaries? They will be the strongest and have the most advanced military and weaponry to protect us from global threats. Are you threatened by a market crash? They will be the ones that usher in economic prosperity. Are you threatened by unemployment? They will bring jobs to those out of work and unemployment relief. Are you threatened by deteriorating health and health care costs? They will solve the health care problem. Are you threatened by injustice? They will be the ones to bring justice to our country. Are you threatened by climate change? They will solve the climate change problem. Are you threatened by government overreach? They will be the ones to protect your freedoms. These elected officials have a very important position, and it is a high calling of service that God calls them to. But how many kings, how many presidents, how many rulers, even the best ones, have really saw, saved us from our troubles? How many have actually saved us from our troubles? And how many are bad servants of God and have become another source of conflict. Personally, I can't imagine even wanting to hold positions of high power, and I have a lot of suspicion for people that really want that job because what? Why would you want to have all that power and be responsible for all those deaths? I just have this, I just have this suspicion that I haven't. And do you know why? It's because I know my own heart. I know my own lack of wisdom. I know my own tendency towards a lack of self-control or making quick judgments that are not always the best. So to think of somebody who actually wants that role and to have your sin and your failures on display on the national stage just does not appeal to me. Not only that, but have your sin have devastating impacts on many, many, many people. And that's what we often see with kings in the world. But what if it was different? What would it look like if we had a different, another kind of king? One that brought real rescue, real joy, real hope for the future. I believe the reason, one of the reasons why we all, the world instinctively always puts all of their problems upon the king and looks for hope there is because we were wired by God to look and long for the king who is righteous and good and wise and, and glorious. It's just not those kings. This psalm today is a celebration of and, uh, and joy. It's a song of celebration and joy that is sung by God's people, rejoicing in their God for giving their king deliverance from their enemies. And the original context for the writing of this psalm was probably this. King David had gone out to fight a battle. God gave him deliverance and victory. He comes back and the people are coming out to meet him and they're singing praises, but they're not singing praises to the king. They're singing praises to the God who delivered him. 
The people are rejoicing because God's deliverance and his victory was the king's deliverance and victory. And they're rejoicing because the king's deliverance and victory is their deliverance and victory. It's a song that looks back in thanksgiving on what God has done for his king and in the present proclaims and rejoices in God's unshakable covenant love for the king. And he looks forward to the ways that God will cont- continue to deliver his king from his enemies. The key to this psalm is the relationship of the people to the king and the king to God. And that should remind us of someone. It should remind us of King Jesus. Through Jesus, our king, God blesses his people. There are a lot of psalms like this that are in singing about how wondrous God is. And when they talk about the king and they're referring to King David, it's actually really hard to imagine these things being true of King David. That's because they are all pointing us towards another king that would be coming in the story. This is why Jesus in the New Testament is often referred to as fulfilling the promises of the Psalms and the longing of the Psalms, and why Jesus was referred to as what? The Son of David. As we look at this Psalm, written during the time of King David, we will see so many ways that we can rejoice in our King, Jesus, who is the fulfillment of them. So in the, in the rest of our time, I want to spend... Uh, looking at these three angles that we see in this psalm. First, the strength of the king. Second, the desire of the king. And third, the joy of the king. Strength, desire, joy. So first, the strength of the king. When you think of strength in the context of a king, what comes into your mind? Weapons, maybe, right? Weapons, maybe political brilliance, maybe tactical and strategic mastery, maybe, uh, like I said, weapons and wealth and power, all the things that you would need in order to control an army and reign supreme. Think about military parades, I, I, in my mind, I think of the military parades that are often done in China and North Korea. Where, what, what do they do? They, they bring out all of their tanks, and the armies come out, and they march in all of their splendor and glory and numbers, and they tote out their missiles. And what are they usually holding in their hands? Pictures of the ruler, pictures of the king. And what's the point of that? The point is, Hey, all you surrounding countries, watch out. We're strong. And what's the point, the message to their own people? We will protect our land. We are strong. The more strength like this we have, the more we're prone to feeling that we have this godlike power that we can wield in order to control our destiny. In fact, Napoleon Bonaparte, that famous short French emperor put it this way, God is on the side with the best artillery. Seems a little flipped. If you have the best artillery and he's on your side, what, are, you, are you saying that God is smaller than your artillery and he likes your side, or is he saying that your artillery came from God? Whatever it is, it seems like the artillery is the key thing there. We think about numbers and alliances. We think about tactical and strategic brilliance. And yet, in this psalm, how many of those things do you see? They're celebrating a victory. How many of these these things of glory, these praises of the chariots, of the weapons, of the bows, you don't see a glorification of them at all because they are not being identified as the source of the king's strength. And this, stra- this, is, this would have been an incredibly strange absence in the time of these ancient kings to not glory in your weapons and in your numbers. 
But the strange absence of these things is actually completely in line with the law that God gives his people about kings. Listen to this in Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 17. When you come to the land that your Lord God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again, and you shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. For shall he acquire for himself, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Kings aren't to acquire many horses, many wives, nor are they to acquire excessive silver and gold. Why? It's really easy to read over that section because it's kind of foreign to us. But this is absolutely radical and unprecedented direction for kings. Why? Gerald Wilson helps us see just how radical this is. Horses were the essential component for creating a core of horse-drawn chariotry, the A-bomb of military technology of the day. In essence, the kings were being told not to rely on military power. Multiple marriages were the means by which ancient kings cemented pol- political treaties and relationships with foreign nations. By rejecting such political maneuvering, the kings were asked to give up another source of kingly power. The final reference to gold and silver is by now more clear. Financial power has always been one of the necessary trappings of political and military power. Why this bizarre direction to basically have a nation with a king that is, is weak in the sight of all the nations? Why this rejection of normal kingly strength? Because this king, the king of God's people, was to rely upon and trust in God to be his strength. In this psalm, the people rejoice because the king has indeed become the recipient of God's deliverance through God's strength. This song has bookends. And when you ever have bookends on something, it means pay attention. This part's really important. It's the border of the psalm. Listen, it begins with this. O Lord, in your strength, the king rejoices, and in your salvation, how greatly he exalts. And it ends with these words. Be exalted, O Lord, in your your strength. We will sing and praise your power. Psalm 20, which comes right before Psalm 21, if you know how to do math, also tells a similar story and actually contrasts the Lord with the normal strengths of the other nations. Listen, Psalm 20, 7 to 8. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Not only that, the rhythm and the cadence of the psalm in Psalm 21 is constantly turning on the word you. It's constantly, it's, it's, it's a song that's being sung to God, but the cadence is not you, and then there's a bunch of other stuff. It's you did this, you did this, you did this. It's you have given him his heart's desire. You meet him with blessings. You put a crown on his head. You give the king life. It's your salvation. You fight your enemies. You destroy them. You cause them to flee. The psalm declares that the salvation of the king was completely due to the strength of the Lord. This is why when Jesus shows up as king, He doesn't show up in the appearance of royal strength. This is why when he he shows up, he's born into poverty. He's born into obscurity. And he doesn't know anybody in high places. 
because his strength was greater than all of those kings. His strength was in the Lord. And what kind of strength is this? This is the strength of the one who is infinitely strong. This is the strength of the one who has set the stars in their place. This is the strength of the one who holds the universe together by his word. This is the strength of the one who holds every life and every breath in his hand of every human being and could easily just, and they're all gone. This is the strength of the one who, has, who is infinitely wise and he has no need for strategic alliances. This is the strength of the one who does not depend on silver and gold because he made it all. The terrifying strength of this God is on display in the psalm where he's described as defeating his enemies. Listen, Psalm 21, 8 to 9. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath, and fire will consume them. Nothing could be more terrible and frightening than being this God's enemy. And nothing could be more peaceful than having this God as your God, the God who protects you, the God who loves you and wants to keep you safe and saved. But there is nothing more terrifying than being this God's enemy. This is why David, the king, was also a songwriter. God wins the battles. The king sings the songs. <laughs> God wins the battle. The king rejoices in the strength of his God. In fact, sometimes God uses the songs to defeat the enemies. There's a story in 2 Chronicles 20. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible where King Jehoshaphat is being threatened by the Moabites, and the Moabite army is, is, uh, is approaching the armies of Judah. And Jehoshaphat talks to his army, and he says, this is like the worst, this is the worst army speech ever. The battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. And then you know what he does? He gets the choirs, and he puts them in front of the armies. And he has them sing. And he doesn't have them sing these crazy, like, hate war songs. He has them sing songs of thanksgiving for God's sustaining, sovereign, and covenantal grace. This is why we sing the doxology so much at Cormdale. This is why we sing it before we leave. Because these are our weapons. We, nothing has changed here. God is glorified in the worship of his name. And that is why singing is dangerous because it glorifies the God who is stronger than any weapon humanity has ever wielded. Don't think small thoughts about the songs you are called to sing. And what is true for the king is true for us. God wins our battles. God acts on behalf of his people. During times of distress and conflict, we need to remember this. We need to celebrate this. We need to be people who are singing out of the joy of their hearts in the midst of even times of conflict or singing lament. We're singing to God no matter what it is because it's not our measly strength that will carry us through our hardest times. And aren't you relieved about that? <laughs> How many times have you looked back on your hardest time that you've gone through? And in the middle, midst of that time, you were thinking, where is God? What is going on here? And then you look back five years later, 10 years later, and you think, he was there the whole time, and he brought me 
through it. And he saw things I did not see. And he brought me into places I did not know to go. He will fight the battles for his people. And sometimes it's hard to know how he does it, but he will do it. This is why we sing the song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We sing, if we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he, the Lord of hosts, his name from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. This song speaks of our utter inability and God's magnificent strength and mercy and grace that he shows us through Jesus. All our striving is losing. He must win the battle. And this psalm rejoices not only in the strength of the king, but kind of oddly in the desire of the king which is my second point, the desire of the king. After this song opens with a declaration of, the, of praise for the God being the strength of the king, it praises God for how he hears and answers the requests of the king. Listen to Psalm 21, 2. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. I don't know about you, but in general, the idea of God giving most of the kings in the world the desire of their heart is kind of a frightening thing. It's difficult to tell what is in the heart of a ruler because they're only always telling us what we want to hear. Not so with this king. His desires are consistent with the request of his lips. But what is his Desire. What is this thing that the king desires? Listen to Psalm 20, 40. Oh, sorry. I mentioned earlier that Psalm 20 was kind of a prequel to Psalm 21. And we can actually in Psalm 20 see what the request is. So listen, listen to this request. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation, and in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Listen to that again. May we shout for joy over your salvation, and in the name of God, set up our banners. The desire of the king's heart is salvation and deliverance, not for himself alone, but for his people. That reference to banners is important. Do you know what the banners of God's people had written on them? Go look at Numbers. It's the first time in the, in the book of Bible. It's actually the, the first one before this time the banners are mentioned. The banners had written on them the names of the tribes of the people of God, the names of God's people. So you have to imagine a king going out into a battle, and he's praying to God, his father, and he's looking around, and he's seeing the banners with the names of the tribes that he is the king over, and that he is called to protect and serve and love. And you know what he's praying about? His people. He's praying for the salvation that God would give him so that that would go out to his people. He's driven by love for his people. The desire of the king is for the protection, the life, and the salvation of his people. Psalms 21.4 says, He asked life of you, and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. Remember, his salvation is their salvation. His life is their life. The life that he wants is the life that will be for his people. Again, Jesus is the greatest fulfillment 
of these hopes. In fact, it was, listen to these words spoken by the angel to, the, to Mary about Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give, him, give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. When he asks for life and God gives it to him, Length of days forever and ever. That's speaking of the throne that belongs to Jesus. Jesus is the king sung of in this psalm. And like the king desires the salvation of his people, so Jesus, too, desires the salvation of his people. But for us, our need for salvation is way beyond being rescued from a battlefield. Our need for salvation is way beyond needing economic prosperity. Our need for salvation is way beyond our need for health care reform. Our salvation that we need desperately is way beyond our need for employment. Our enemies are far greater than foreign adversaries or socioeconomic problems. Our need for salvation is immense because every aspect of our life is plagued by our sin. And in our sin and our rebellion against the God of infinite holiness, we are enemies of God. And nothing, like I said earlier, could be more frightening than that. The second half of the psalm, which is all about God routing and destroying his enemies in his, and swallowing them up in his wrath, could be sung and would be sung about us if it were not for the desire of the king to save us. It was this desire of King Jesus that led him to the cross. His desire cost him his life on the cross to pay the debt that you owed for your sin, to bear the wrath of God against his enemies and to reconcile us to God. But it was our names on those banners. It was our names, the names of God's people lifted that he saw, and God gave him victory for the sake of his desire and his glory. So we read in Ephesians 5, 2, Christ loved us. Just pause on that. Christ loved us. And he gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Do you know that Christ, the King, loves you, that he desires you? Even with all your sin, somehow he desires you. The Gospel of John, the Lord Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. This knowing is a knowing that is deeply connected to loving. How wondrous to know that though you have nothing to bring to the table except for your sin and rebellion that makes you an enemy, and yet God in his wondrous grace loves you and even desires you. I can't wrap my head around God desiring me. But do you know what the people of God are described as? The bride of Christ. Could there be an, a more intense word to use to describe the desire that God has for his people? I'm married. I know the desire that got me there. There could not be a more intense way to think about God loving and desiring his people. And in this love, which comes to us through the Son, in this desire, our king is also a, God, a king of joy. 
which is my last point, the joy of the king. At the time of Jesus' birth, you'll remember, it's said of King Herod, who was over Jerusalem, that he was troubled. And all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. As the king goes, so the city goes. Unhappy kings make for very unhappy kingdoms. In this psalm, this king celebrated is not simply a victorious king. He's not simply a king with long life, but a king of joy and blessing that comes from God. Listen to verse 3. You meet him with rich blessings, and you set a, a crown of fine gold on his head. The description of God blessing his king here, we don't realize it. It's just, it's mind-boggling, okay? Because the word for meet is the word that would have been applied to a servant running out to meet the king as he comes back from battle to sing his praises and put a crown on his head and say, yay, our king, our king. But it's used of God. It's used of God talking about this king. This king, God runs out to him with blessings and puts a victory crown on his head. And then he's described as receiving glory and splendor and majesty and blessing and gladness and joy in God's presence. Listen to Psalm 21, 5 to 6. His glory is great through your salvation, splendor and majesty you bestow on him. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. This is nothing less than the description of the amazing love, the amazing infinite love that God the Father has for his son. This king, Jesus, knows the joy of the presence of God. Our king is jovial. Do you ever think about God as being jovial? You should. God is a king of, he's jovial, he's a king of laughter. The God who was the creator of every earthly pleasure and every joy and every moment of laughter is himself the greatest pleasure and the greatest joy, and this king rejoices in his presence. There has never been a more joyful man than Jesus. Never. And yet, Jesus is described as what? A man of sorrows. Why? And on the cross, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because that is what it cost him to bring us into his joy. Jesus stood in our place condemned without the presence of his Father, his highest joy, so that we could be brought into the joy and gladness of the Son of God, the King. And then his Father went and met him in the grave, and he put a victory crown on him, and he raised him up in victory over our enemies, sin, Satan, and death. And by Jesus his love for us and desire to save us. He died and he rose again for our salvation. He defeated our rebellion. He has made us his people and now he has given us his joy, which is the joy of his father. You know the prodigal son story? How the father runs out to meet his sinful, dirty, wandering abandoning son, how he runs out to meet him, forgetting all the etiquette of a man of the house, girding up his his clothes to run and meet his filthy son. There are beautiful paintings of what this could look like. A glorious father hugging a, a young man in clothing stained by the pig pens. 
We are like that prodigal now. We have a father who meets us like he meets the king with blessings and puts a robe on our shoulders and a ring on our finger, and he welcomes us home. How wonderful is that? Oh, that we would see it and that the joy of the Lord would be our strength during these hard times. Let's pray. Father, we look to you and the wonderful deliverance you have given us in Jesus. We think about our sins and the many ways that daily we slight your heart your infinite holiness. We think of the many ways that we're cynical about you. We think of the many ways that we would rather fight our own battles and get angry and lose our peace and joy. God, set our hearts, set our affections, set our sights on the fact that we have a king who wins our battles. Help us, God, to have the peace and the joy that can carry us even through the moments of the worst conflict. Help us to be a people that sing the songs, the songs that glorify you and your great deliverance, and help us to be a people who rejoice in you. In your name we pray. Amen. In a moment, we are going to invite you to celebrate communion. If you're not a Christian, this is simply a time to consider the call of Jesus. During this time, this strange time, we're going to be bringing you the elements. And we'll come to your, uh, serve them by household. And if, if you don't want to receive communion or you're not a Christian, feel free to just wave us away. That's totally fine. But we take the wafer and we dip it in the juice. And then afterwards, we will come and uh, retrieve the containers from you. But Corinthians 11, 23 to 26 says that the Lord on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus is our king who for the joy set before him endured the cross so that we would be saved. Through his death and resurrection, he has given us his victory over sin and death. And now he invites us to his table where we can celebrate in the presence of of our jovial king. We come to the table only on the basis of what he has done for us. Remember, he must win the battle. He has done it for us. And we turn our back on every effort and striving to in our own strength and we rest in his mighty grace. We are celebrating because our king has rescued us so that we might praise his name. Additionally, we invite you and encourage you to give of your tithes and offerings as a, as a, with a cheerful and worshiping heart to our God, re learning to rest in him instead of our wealth. And finally, we're going to sing. We're going to sing the songs to our king. He wins the battle. We sing the songs. He's worthy of our worship. Would you please stand with me? as we respond in worship together.
church. Amen. It is good to worship with you this morning, to sing songs, to read and hear God's word, to celebrate with communion. And in just a moment, we will be dismissed to return to our ordinary lives. And as we go out, I want to um, read Ephesians 3 to send us out. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, 
that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Church, Jesus loves you so much. As we go out, we've been doing this these last few weeks. We want to end with the doxology. So I want to invite the pastors up here as we close our service with praise. Please join and lift up a hand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And as we go out, for those that like tasty treats, we will find some popsicles in the parking lot. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. You're dismissed.